<laughs> Move it along. It's exactly. <sighs> Wait, three minutes. Okay. Three minutes until. Should we somehow engage the audience? Or no? I think we have already. Okay. I think we've done a nice job, actually. Talking to the people we know. Okay. I will have to use my cheater glasses to introduce you because that's what I need. Are you going to introduce me first, or am I going to introduce you first? I will introduce you. Okay. Oh. I thought Tobias might be coming. I thought too, but maybe, you know, they couldn't. Yeah. Was Valerie too. everybody and um, thank you very much for coming to yet another presentation in the uh, series on robots and artificial intelligence. This is our um, pre-last uh, presentation, right? The last one will be in on May 2nd uh, at the uh, DUC Theater. So uh, back to uh, UWSB campus. Uh, and you might also want to return there, uh, not this Friday, but next Friday, we will be doing a screening of iHuman. It's a 2019 documentary about artificial intelligence. It premiered on uh, first, I think, uh, at the Amsterdam International uh, Film Festival. Um, really um, questions what Europeans are doing about artificial intelligence policies, laws, and how it can change our market and uh, also humanity in general, which has been the emphasis of this series. So thank you very much for coming, supporting us, asking questions. Today, we have James Berry, who will be presenting uh, with me on bias and the language of AI. I am extremely thankful to you, James, for accepting to present. And I just want to tell you a little bit about James. So James is the Associate Professor of English, uh, specializing in linguistics at UWSP. He's also a coordinator of the Linguistics and Language Studies cer uh, Interdisciplinary Certificate. And I know many of our students in Correct. languages right. uh, love your certificate. Um, his research interests range from historical English syntax to sociolinguistics. Uh, to the scholarship of uh, teaching and learning in linguistics as well. Yes. He is currently a Wisconsin teaching scholar and will present an equity-minded uh, research project, um, SOTL project, on decolonizing the introductory linguistic syllabus. Um, it will happen next week, next right? Week. Next week in Madison uh, at the UW System OPID conference. Um, in the fall, you will be teaching a very popular course. I know your students love it. So I'm excited about it. It's Introduction to Linguistics and Invented Languages. So students actually get to make up a language, right. write uh, syntax, uh, Everything. Sound system, morphology, semantics, pragmatics, they get to make up every part of it. They also engage in some world building, so it should be a lot of fun. Thank you. Absolutely. And 
I'm throwing on my cheaters so that I can introduce Vera Klokovkina. She's an associate professor of French and chair of the Department of World Languages and Literatures at UWSP. Her research interests are varied and range from 19th to 21st French and Francophone studies to world cinema and women and gender studies. She has published and presented her research on Marcel Proust, Emmanuel Levinas, and Amélie Notom. She also conducts pedagogical projects for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning uh, to investigate teaching in the language classroom. Or, I'm sorry, teaching practices. It's a long list and I'm missed, <laughs> I skipped a line. Uh, that enhance student linguistic proficiency in the target language. Her most recent publications are Machine Translation, Friend or Foe in the Language Classroom, and Radical Hope for Global French Studies. She is currently working on a larger project on AI and artificial caregivers in world cinema. She's a recipient of the UWSP University Excellence in Teaching Award, Excellence in Service Award, and Leadership Mentor Award. She also serves as the UWSP Assessment Coordinator. So <laughs> just the one or two things. All right, so. Let's do it. Let's do it. So our talk will be organized basically in two pieces. At first, we're gonna talk a little bit about linguistics. Um, so if you're not terribly familiar with linguistics, I'll introduce some terms, and I will quiz you on what your language uses, usage is like. Could you be biased in your own language usage? Hint, the answer is always going to be yes. <laughs> um, what can happen if unconscious language biases sneak into your language? So think about that a little bit. We will then move on to the linguistics of AI. We'll talk first about biases in language structure. So language structure includes the sound system, speech, uh, word system, sentence system. So those sort of structural aspects of language. Um, and we will look at speech recognition, the syntax of bots like ChatGPT. And our discussion of ChatGPT will sort of segue us into semantics or meaning-based discussions. Um, and we'll look at biases in language meaning, specifically at search engines and at translation software. Because why do you need to learn French when you can use Google Translate, right? Exactly. So. A fairly important question for you. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take a look at language through the lens of sociolinguistics. Well, sociolinguistics is essentially um, a way of examining the intersection between language and society, pretty straightforwardly. We look at variations among several different social categories, and we love to categorize ourselves. Because of that, we love to sort of look for markers of category in and among ourselves. Those can include race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, national origin, age, geographic location. So when I'm talking with my students, they're always good about pointing out what towns in Wisconsin sound the funniest, <laughs> or pronounce bag as big, or which I had to kind of learn when I came up here. This leads us to the idea of language ideologies. So ideology is kind of a scary word perhaps, but these are basically belief systems that surround the social meanings associated with language variation. All of those variations that I was just mentioning and the forms of discourse that connect those meanings to broader social structures. So if you say something and you can be identified by your speech as belonging to a certain social category, this is what we're looking at with language ideologies. We all possess these ideologies and some of them aren't the nicest ideologies. So this is something which we often use, language is a tool that is sometimes used to judge people. This is shocking to you, I know, but it's true. <laughs> so, we have these ideologies, there's only one correct way to speak a certain language. This is a big one, this is about language standards. And language standards are widely discussed and yet still somehow kind of accepted in the language classroom, yeah. people are taught the standard form of a language. So we think of that as being, okay, yeah, that's kind of the way things work. People from XYZ always sound like they're stupid. I know people who think this way. So 
they have a particular place in the map, and they associate that with some sort of negative social quality. And they say, if you sound like that place, you sound some sort of negative association is placed on that. And then this is America speak English. Um, I'm sure we've all heard that as well. This is something that it's thrown around popularly and maybe not so popularly. So we have languages, we have dialects, we have accents. Language is sort of that big umbrella category. Dialects, everyone on earth, if they speak a language, they speak a dialect. It doesn't matter whether you think you speak the standard or not, these are all dialects. And sometimes dialect gets associated with substandard variety. But everyone speaks a dialect. And then dialects, their speech, and we're gonna focus mainly, mainly on speech over other modalities like signing or writing. Their speech comes out in an accent. I have an accent, you have an accent, we all have an accent. So I want you to think for a moment about these concepts and ask yourself, what accents do you dislike or find really irritating? Because deep down we all have peeves, we all have pet peeves, and often they're about language, and there are some accents we hear and we're just like, Ugh, I don't like that. Which accents are considered low class or unintelligent? Which dialects are not deemed important enough to be taught in schools? And if you happen to come from one of those dialect groups, how does that make you feel? If your language is not deemed important enough to be taught? And then how do you feel about your own language? Because people who are coming from the wrong side of a language ideology know it. It's been told to them since they were very small. And so what they often do is internalize something called linguistic insecurity or anxiety. And that means that they're maybe less comfortable to speak up in class, maybe less comfortable to speak up in public, maybe worried about being identified by some of these markers. And also for language learning, is which accent do you try to imitate? So for me, this is not only a pretty picture, that is the movie that I used when I was in Russia to learn English. Because on Tuesdays, they would show English films, and on Wednesdays, French films. And it was free, and I would go. And I watched this probably 10 times. And of course, Eliza Doolittle's linguistic journey, right, to say, the rain is Spain, stays manly on the plane. I actually had to repeat it 20 times so I could repeat correctly, yes. right? the better pronunciation, not when she And the better British pronunciation. Exactly, speaks at the because beginning of the film. Because you just called her film. Eliza Doolittle? Yes. So that's very British. <laughs> I, would say, I would say Eliza Doolittle <laughs> in a very, very American way. All right, can these ideologies cause harm? Hint, yes, they can cause harm. So we're going to Let's see if I can get this to play. A professor of linguistics from Stanford University in California. This is about John Baugh. John joins us in Detroit to demonstrate an experiment he's been conducting for years about how Americans react to different accents. It's called linguistic profile. First, he checks the rental housing section in the city paper. Then he calls properties that are advertised for rent. He calls first using an African American accent. Yes, my name is Michael Davis. I was calling to see if you might have any houses for rent that might be available. Then he calls again, speaking with a Latino accent. Hello, this is Juan Ramirez. I'm talking about the apartment you have advertised in the paper. Yes. All right. Finally, he calls in a perfectly neutral American accent, which is, in fact, how he really talks. There's no neutral accent. I'm actually going to get some mixed results today, but generally speaking, minority dialects do not fare as well, and particularly in the affluent communities. Is that race or economic class? It's both. Race in and of itself will not be the factor that excludes one from a particular neighborhood. 
for a house for sale in the Nassau community. So uh, Ba has been conducting this experiment for a long time. And you can see this is slightly dated. There were pay phones. He was looking at it. He was looking at a newspaper to get rental listings. Um, but ten years later, what yeah, do we get? It's not that different. So, and this we, is from "Do You Speak American?" So let's see. But ten years later, we're going to get an app that is going to wash out your accent and will yes. make you sound American. Right, or white right. American. Right, so this is being sold to call centers around the world. Hi, this is Alex from the customer service gate. How are you today? Great to hear. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for asking. So how can I help you today? I'm so sorry about that. I'll be glad to help you. Can I get your phone name, phone number? Same voice, same person. <laughs> Was a demonstration of a software known as Sonus. Should I stop? It's a start yeah. So this is by a company named Sonus. It's a startup company. They are selling these voice filters to mm -hmm. call centers internationally to mask um, a South Asian accent, like mm -hmm. you heard it first, and turn it into a, again, neutral. American accent, as if neutrality was actually possible. Um, and this is being sold to companies who have large call centers. And if you look the next slide, I put their advertisement. Oh, like, oops. Yeah. So look at this. They say, sound local globally. Right. But that's not true, right? So it's misadvertisement because they want you to sound um, English or sound one American. location American globally, meaning to erase all the differences. And right? standard American. Yes. So this is not just about housing or about call centers. Language bias, which gets expressed as linguistic profiling, can be a, a form of gatekeeping, keeping people from food, from jobs, from education, from healthcare, from any sort of opportunity available otherwise out there. So, then we ask ourselves, well, but aren't computers neutral? And Hal says, hello, Dave, <laughs> right? Um, aren't they able to work with any and all language? We know that computers do not just arise in and among themselves. They are created. They are created by people and people possess these linguistic ideologies that we were just talking about. So when we look at computer engineers and programmers, they are frequently not trained in linguistics. This tends to be the case outside of something like syntax. Syntax is the area that typically computer programmers are trained in because this is about structure and they respond well to structure. But sociolinguistics is the softer side of linguistics, softer my air quotes. Um, it's the human side of linguistics. It's the way language gets used. And so what frequently happens is that people go into this field and they affect the kinds of technologies that we just glanced at and we will see many more of without having an idea of how they might be affecting people. And that's part of the problem. So we'll start out with speech. Speech recognition technologies. We know that there are several out there. Siri, um, Alexa, Cortana, uh, Google. In 2021, Kinnikey et al. compared word error rates by speech recognition technologies when responding to US speakers, consistently US speakers, of black English and white English. These are essentially percentages of errors made by the systems created by these companies. Every single one is twice or more with regard to errors. So, just an accidental coincidence? 
it's hard to argue that. Um, we will take a look at how this gets played out. All right, what do I click on? The, the, the sound? The sound. Thing. Nothing? Okay. Mm -hmm. Galaxy, I'd like to go to the last speaker of English. English is her first language. She's a speaker of English that in many ways is actually closer to UK English than American English is. She's from Trinidad and Tobago. And did you decide, did you discover that that was impossible to understand what she was saying? No, what Galaxy did. So she has a Galaxy phone, and we cannot blame Galaxy for this because Apple also has its own issues. Um, so when we look at this, she's unable to use her phone in a way that it is programmed for her to use. If we look at Siri, which of course is an Apple product, how many languages does Siri support? Apple lists countries. Each of these countries has a different dialect, but Trinidad and Tobago is not on there. Um, so there are nine English dialects. There are about five Spanish dialects, four French dialects, three German and Dutch dialects. What kind of languages have I just named off? English, Spanish, French, German, Dutch. Colonizing. Colonizing <laughs> languages of Europe, right? Um, we have some others, there's Cantonese, and you have some distinction between the mainland and Hong Kong. You have Mandarin, the mainland, and Taiwan. You have UAE, um, Arabic, and, and Saudi Arabic, but by and large, these are not languages that are found outside a fairly small group, only about 20 languages. We have about 6,500 to 7,000 languages in the world that are used by people. Something like this automatically sets up an inequity, right? If you have use of this technology, because you have use of one of these languages or dialects of a language, then you have some advantages over people who do not. So the industry is kind of aware of this. They're starting to do some response. One of their solutions is to create more training data so they're crowdsourcing this. This is a Mozilla project. It's called Common Voice. It's a website where people can record themselves saying certain words. Hint, nobody's going to ask me to record anything because they have plenty of cis, old, white guys with my voice already saying all of these words. They are looking for people who are not part of this group. What is this website set up in? What language? It's set up in English. They have collected 108 languages. I'm sure it's not an even number. I'm sure many of these languages has, have very few um, tokens. About 27,000 hours of recorded speech, 
but 108 languages, again, out of 6,500 to 7,000 is not a huge number. So the, the disproportionate numbers are clear. And of course, donate your voice. I don't know if that triggers anything in you, in me, the Stepford wives right away, right? So yeah, all these women who donated their voices suddenly get killed and replaced by <laughs> the robots. So I don't know. Um, on the one hand, it sounds wonderful. On the other hand, until how long and how far do we want the technology to replace humans, right? Well, on the other side, it also says help us validate voices. Yeah. So your, valid, your voice may be invalid unless it's validated. Yeah. So, continuing problems, right? Um, what about our voice assistants? So companies have downloaded many more voice recordings of feminine voices and use them more often for voice assistants than masculine voices. This is only starting to change a little bit and it's, you, you have some options in certain of these technologies. But why would this be? First of all, to Gendered. one of Vera's points, anthropomorphizing is expected. It should sound human. It should sound Stepford wifeish. Mm -hmm. Ready to help. Ready to help. Yes. Then there are gendered expectations of a helpful and compliant assistant. That does not push back. Right. <laughs> I'm seeing different responses from different people. The women in the audience are going, uh. <laughs> and then companies, of course, may be relying on misogynistic stereotypes here. So um, we have some real issues that continue to go on. However, actual human voices are relatively lacking. So according to the Brookings Institution, women make up just under 20% of students graduating with a bachelor's degree in engineering any engineering. 18.7% um, of computer software engineers are women. 22.8% of computer hardware engineers are women. And 23.6% of technical roles at Google. At Google. So um, kind of interesting. And then when we look at black and Latina women, they occupy less than 1.5% of leadership roles in Silicon Valley companies. So the companies themselves, first of all, they are building based on a profit model, right? They're looking to sell you an Alexa or a Cortana. I didn't even know about Cortana until I did this research. I'd never heard of it, but apparently Microsoft's trying to get into this stuff. Um, but they're trying to sell this to you. Look at the names. Siri, Alexa, Cortana, gendered female, right? Um, and then Look at that compared to the number of roles. 80% across the board of people working in this industry who are decision making are not um, identifying as women. Okay, we're gonna move on to chat GPT. <laughs> <sighs> I hear the, the English department makes a collective groan. Um, <laughs> I'm almost tired of talking about ChatGPT, but here we go. So what exactly is ChatGPT? GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. It is pre-trained, so we were talking about training data in a couple steps back. It is pre-trained with a bunch of data. ChatGPT is what's called an LLM or large language model, meaning that it uses a lot of data gathered from internet sources to develop predictive text in response to a communicative need. It's capable of sorting through large data sets to gather information and because it understands meaning and context, give or take, um, give users a thoroughly accessible answer to a question. What it does really well is syntax. Again, structure. It gives answers that are nicely and appropriately structured for an English sentence or an English paragraph or whatever our expectations are. The reality, though, is that sometimes content is not so beautiful. So bias creeps into ChatGPT, some responses to questions, even basic mathematical questions, which you would think everyone would get right, 
have been answered incorrectly and sometimes nonsensically. Mm -hmm. The data that's been gathered has often been minimally vetted or not at all, re resulting in responses that show racism, misogyny, homophobia, ethnocentrism, ableism, ageism, etc. Every ism you can think of because it's all out there on the web and ChatGPT is just a big sweeping thing gathering this all together. And then Google ethics officer Tim Jibru was forced out in 2020 for pointing out the bias flaws of this big unwashed data. Her departure encouraged other companies to walk back their ethics monitoring, including OpenAI that makes ChatGPT. And ChatGPT was in a rush to get out first before mm -hmm. Google's models, Microsoft's models, et cetera. And so they didn't do that much work on the ethics end of things. Again, mm -hmm. that's just soft language stuff, right? Well, it's not like they didn't have time to think about it, right? For Google Translate, for us, what ha is happening right now with ChatGPT, it was in 2016 when they came out with machine learning and neural language processing that mimics brain processing. Because suddenly, we as language instructors were getting papers beautifully written in French with complex subjunctive Right? We're like, no, you don't know that exactly. <laughs> you, you don't know that it's a different mood, and now you used it in the past tense. No French person actually knows how to conjugate them, so I don't think you know how to conjugate them. But students were taking their English uh, written text, right. putting it in Google, Google Translate, and were receiving actually really well translated. Uh, after a while. After a while. Well, after At first, it was messy. Well, 2016, that's when the big, big break happened. Yeah. And so we had time to adjust to it, to come up with different um, teaching techniques. That's why I really got right. into um, SOTL projects, because I thought, like, I need to make sure that students own their language. Yes. Yeah. And it is about ownership of your language in multiple ways here. All right, how about search engines? Well, that's also very important for, Beautiful. thank you, for language learning, right? Because we want students to use Google, there are different um, engines that will help actually conjugate verbs and so on. And so you think that they are all um, neutral, right? Because they're just available. Well, little did we know, or little did I know, until I talked to James. Um, he had faculty college, right, right. Uh, past summer, and he gave me this book. And I'm like, oh, yes, I'm all into algorithms. I need to read and learn more about it. And this is a fantastic read um, written by Sophia Umoja Noble, who is an associate professor at UCLA and in the Department of Information Studies. And she also directs, um, I think, African Studies Center um, and Technology. So the whole project for her was when she was preparing for a birthday party for her daughter, who was seven years old at that time. And it was, I think, in 2010. I think so, um, yeah. The uh, internet is still, you know, kind of a new thing and she started looking for black girls thinking let's see what my girls Activities will find for my daughter right and um, it was a lot of porn sites right away right well today so um, what is it 13 years later if you put black girls which On I being. did um, you still I mean now you get a little bit better but when she, mm. yeah, I mean, still, you know, we're now going into beauty as if there is nothing else for a woman but just her beauty, right? right? But um, when she looked at this, um, she started writing to the companies and saying, what's going on? And they said, well, that's just the code. But then who is responsible for the code? So if you code without thinking, what implicit or explicit messages get um, transferred through uh, search engines, then you miss the point. And the point for her was that not only are African Americans 
underemployed at Google, and we saw with your data, right, Facebook, right. Snapchat, and other popular technology companies as computer programmers, but jobs that could employ the expertise of people who understand the ramifications of racist and sexist stereotyping and misrepresentation, and that require undergraduate, here, of course, me, our school, I'm like, I need to bring this quote to Tobias. This should be our school's quote. Because if we think IT students, right, students who take um, um, computing classes may never take a course or advanced degree in ethics, black and African American studies, women and gender studies, or American Indian or Asian African studies. So them not having this information, not right. having any awareness of misrepresentation that is there in the information available will definitely create or contribute to the digital, digital divide, right. right? So, and digital divide, of course, understood on a much larger scale and what you were showing with the linguistic profiling, right? right. It affects every single factor, right? So geographical, cultural, social, economic. So today, the devices that we use to search for information are very important, right? Because the search engines are not just helpers. They are commercial optimization engines that work right. on ads, right? So in order, yes. you are the product basically because it's free, but when you are looking at the results and all the ads that get feed, uh, fed to you are based on the algorithms of what you're looking for. So for me, of course, it was very important to think about Google Translate and language education. And um, I know that today I have to compete, for example, something like this. If you want to spend $200 and buy yourself a Google Pixel Buds, you can travel anywhere in the world and it's connected to Google, Google Translate. So when somebody talks to you, you will hear the translation of what they said in your um, ear, uh, earphones, okay? And then the idea, you use then Google Translate on your phone to translate what you want to say to, to, them. Uh, to them. And so... Again, only 40 languages out of nearly 7,000 in the world. But we know that learning language is not only about the language, it's also right. about um, increasing your cognitive power in general, yes. because you have to memorize things, you have to make connections between sentence structures, but also you need to remember connotations and denotations, right. meaning how is it used in the culture, right? What cultural effects, for example, when you say in French, we oui versus wa, no, you kind of get the meaning, very different. Right. <laughs> um, but I don't know if you've seen this one, Holographic Wonder. So this is a company that uses mixed reality and Azure neural uh, text-to-speech. Um, into Japanese and train it to sound exactly like me. The same voice tone, the same inflections. Now we brought this together my hologram and Azure AI to show you what's possible. So first, I'm going to put on my HoloLens 2 here, and then we'll flip in the room to a special camera so you can see exactly what I'm seeing. Let's get started. First, let me introduce you to Minnie. There she is, my perfect hologram. And thanks to the power of HoloLens 2, she just looks right with me. I'm literally holding my hologram, so natural. Now she's a little small to do a keynote. So let's get her up so she can do full-size Japanese keynote. Rendered keynote. Stop. You just have yeah, to go. Just, so you've seen <laughs> the, the wonder. So right, 
without learning how to speak Japanese, right, without really understanding how culturally she needs to prepare for right. a keynote, you can just make a hologram of yourself with perfect translation, perfect translation, right? So then again, the idea is we deprive ourselves of learning the language, learning the culture, right, because we need to speed up the process. And we don't think that memorization has something super important to us, but me, who worked on Marcel Proust and read seven volumes, right, I cannot forget reading all of this, the right to be forgotten and the right to be remembered is really important, yes. but right to be forgotten uh, legally is also a very important law. So it's the law that European countries have of delisting the information, right? So it's the question of, of digital recording, freedom of information, and data storage. So in 2015, um, U.S. Uh, activists wrote an open letter to Google saying we need to have this because the data is stored, and if it is just put back on the table, let's say 10 years or 20 years from now, it is as if nothing happened to the person, right? But the person grows. We all heard about growth mindset, right? right? So the idea is what is going to happen to our personal privacy? What is to our right to grow, to change, right? to adapt to the environment if the machines with their stored data will simply have the data and bring it to the, to the surface whenever somebody's looking for chat mm -hmm. GPT information, right? right? That's also another question about the uh, confidentially um, kept information, especially in healthcare, right? But we still have this incredible fantasy of well-spoken, natural robots who will be researchers and translators. If you have not seen this film, I highly suggest that you watch this. It's a 2021 romantic sci-fi comedy about a um, humanoid robot who was specifically created for a woman, uh, Alma, uh, and she is a scientist, right? So she is a cuneiform expert, actually, and in order to seduce her, he speaks with a slight British accent, because apparently that's what she likes, in a very high German. So I didn't bring this, <laughs> Katya would appreciate it. And Alma in the middle of the film says, you're not speaking naturally, what is going on? He's like, it's my subjunctive use that you do not appreciate. <laughs> so, um, it's not but, subjunctive again. Again, yes, Always how, subjunctive. How, how not? But, Actually, now in Germany, it, actually very fresh in 2023, they just used AI translation, not only to uh, natural sure. languages, but to uh, ancient languages. And actually there is a twist in the film where because he can access information so quickly, he realizes that the research project she has worked on for three years was duplicated before, therefore it will not be an original project creating a hard act um, uh, for the main character. But again, they have to speak properly, right. but who codes that, who demands it? And if we have robot toys around us who have this washed out language, then what will happen, right? But the biases are applied, right? So he has a slight British accent. And one of the things I was mentioning to Vera when we were talking about this is if you've ever watched a commercial for Lexus automobiles. Lexus automobiles are made by Toyota, just like Cadillac is made by General Motors. They're the fancy ones, right? Um, every US Lexus commercial employs a woman's British received pronunciation, so incredibly posh sounding accent, every single one. Not a Japanese accent, <laughs> but a British accent. So linguistic biases, they show up everywhere. We don't even 
process it sometimes. Well, because we never r really brought that to the attention, right? Right. And I think what the good thing with chat uh, GPT that again, it mobilized the activist. And I don't know if you read about the uh, open letter that was just written and actually with my class, we all read it. And we decided that six months that they are trying to ask for definitely is not gonna be enough. Uh, but it is um, strange that it had to <laughs> be this, you know, um, kind of exposure to the machine that was going crazy. I don't know if you've seen recently, it made up evidence about a sexual harassment case for a professor and just made up information. So it's not only wrong information or slightly incorrect mathematical right. information. But it's, it's dangerous. It's incorrect. dangerous because it's right. completely made up evidence. And so uh, life, uh, Future of Life Institute, um, is trying to stop this, but we should have thought about it earlier. And that's why, for example, I, I don't know if you had a chance to watch 2021 documentary on Netflix, uh, Code Bias, a fantastic documentary about bias in the, not voice recognition, but face recognition, okay? Done by an MIT student who was doing a research for her class right. and she realized that her computer would not recognize her face because she was black student and the, the computer is like where are you and that's why she's like i need to put a white mask so my computer can recognize me right so and we know that this has implications for like uh, test proctoring software for online testing um the even the um Automatic hand wash uh, stations don't recognize dark complexions. So if you're putting your hand in there for soap and it's ours on campus, or at least are black, so um, you put your hand under there for soap, if you are dark complected, it often does not recognize, or you have to kind of sort of do something to make that happen. So this is We're happening fine. right now. Exactly. It's going on right now in lots of aspects of our lives. And what I really like about um, Sophia Noble's uh, quote, it, at the end of the book, she says, social inequity will not be solved by an app, right? An app will not save us. We will not sort out social inequality, lying in bed, staring at our smartphones. So with that, we have a selected bibliography yes. and we are Welcome ready for questions. questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm so Nancy and I'm so Rebecca. So one of these programs survives the majority of the books. We did identify my diet or how I speak. It's one of the most shocking things I ever had was I was a student toward my kid at college. Right. One of the other parents turned to me and said, you're from Long Island, where And she was a speech pathologist. Now we have a program do that and then they can reject my child. Is it appropriate? One of the things that you notice is you don't just donate, but then someone comes along and vets. That's your, ver your variety. Like this, so there's still going to be human con in input with regard to that aspect of things. So yeah, you could still be found inappropriate, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Rebecca. So I was just curious, um, it's interesting, we were just talking about this, and my group is going to say this today, especially that last slide. Um, but what can we do about it um, as we, it's so enmeshed in our lives, how can we, how can we as individuals uh, have some kind of collective action to, to pressure companies into addressing this? Excellent question. I don't think I have an answer, though. At the end, some thoughts that I have might be to treat some of these for-profit companies as utilities that are involved in for-good work instead of for-profit work. And if you, if they're utilities, they should be then 
regu regulated much more carefully by governments. And I think that's part of the problem there is in Silicon Valley and across, uh, I would say, computer work in general, there's this sort of wild west, shoot them up, you know, I'm an individual maverick, I'm out to change the world, I'm gonna do what I want to do. Um, but when technology gets this big, I think we have to have larger sort of bodies step in and start regulating. There are definitely different outcomes for um, activism. And uh, with my class at the end, we're planning to participate in a webinar um, by a conference, AI for Good. So there are definitely entities that talk about the implications of ethics and designing, especially for healthcare, robots that are ethically vetted. Right. Um, but again, we always have to strive against commercialization, right? The same thing as with the um, uh, search engines. They are commercials, right, deep inside. And so, um, I don't know, we would have to be, to unite as a humanity, like an entire humanity and say no. <laughs> I'm not sure that's gonna happen. Yeah. Right. Well, for me, the question was about research, graduate students, and articles. So um, the pressure to publish is so high in yes. academia. And so when you get students who say, oh, well, I need to write something, I need to publish in order to get a better job, then how will that process be vetted, right? And so the same thing as you were talking about scraping, right? So that's basically what ChatGPT is doing, going in wild, scraping all this information, putting it together, and boom, you have a semblance of a research paper. But we know that doing research, it's actually painful, but because it is painful, you hopefully remember Right? Because you went to the library, you read the book, you can say, well, even if you don't remember the name of the author, you can say, oh, that green book, and somebody will recognize it. But when you don't have it, see, the same thing that Google Translate is completely changing uh, one profession, and which is professional translators. Right. So now it's no longer about translating, it's about post editing. But how can you post edit if you don't really know the language? Now people who post edit are usually the carriers, native uh, speakers, or the ones who have learned the language the traditional way. Right. Meaning they went to sociolinguistics class. They talked about... Maybe. Maybe, hopefully, right? And so they know how it would be appropriate in this situation and not in that situation, right? But when we get new generation of users who have only learned it through Google Translate, how will they be able to post edit? And I actually find that in a smaller way, I teach composition as part of my teaching load. And so when I teach the use of, um, uh, what do you call those little bots that give you your works cited page? Um, Grammarly, but those are references, right? Yeah, yeah. the references. So Sorry. Um, I tell the students that sure, you can use that as a first step, but you always need to go in and actually look at the style, understand the style, so that you can edit what they give you because they're going to give you mistakes almost every time. So when you're doing easy biv, it's not as easy as they claim it to be. It's gonna give you a bibliography that has full of of problems. And if you haven't learned a little bit of MLA, APA, Chicago, whatever style you're, you're working with, um, you're not going to be able to then go in there and uh, fix it or even see it or even exactly. recognize it. Recognize it. And then your history professor will fail you. <laughs> this is, I always warn them with history professors. I'm like, the history professors, they want your sources to be correct. 
Yes. I say about it's English true. professors. Uh, <laughs> I may have to start saying it about French professors. We'll exactly. See. So, but the idea also for me and my students when um, sometimes I, I would allow them to use Google Translate, but I tell them, you have to memorize this sentence, right? So if you translate, do not translate the entire paragraph, you will never remember. Translate one sentence. And they said, Madame? I'm like, what? I'm like, that's memorizing. I'm like, yeah, that's memorizing. That's OK. Mon They're like, Dieu. Mon Dieu. They're like, no, it's too difficult. So if that process is very difficult, therefore, how do you retain the information, right? So then I guess you need your pixels, earbuds right. all the time. That's right. Yeah. So I don't know if there are any easy solutions or even obvious solutions yet. There are concerns, I've seen some articles where there are concerns about political bias and what ChatGPT gathers. Mm -hmm. um, that it's too, say, left-leaning. So there is actually impetus, sort of anti-Chat GPT, GPT impetus um, in various sort of more right-leaning um, political groups. So some real concerns from both sides, I would say. Have you experienced, by any chance, a student already using that for their? Oh, tell us, tell us. Two? Really? Oh my goodness. <gasps> right after it came out. Immediately. <laughs> wow. So then I got mine this past Wow. Right. Student writing is the writing of learners. It is, and, it's, and it has personality too. And it has personality too, right. yes. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> Which is yeah. the type of personality. Yeah. I've used desperation for years to, to substitute for my personality. It works, <laughs> works relatively well. Um, but yeah, it, you kind of, if you work with students, you kind of get to know what you expect. And if you get something that is beautifully structured and maybe a bit content-wise, a bit inane. Bland. Or bland, mm -hmm. right. That's a good marker. Actually, um, ironically, the owner of OpenAI, uh, the, the one who uh, launched uh, Chat um, GPT, Chat GPT um, actually wrote an article about the risks of the program before the open letter and everybody in the comments were like well why didn't you think before you actually launched it to the market and um, his main premise was that it's a radical disruptor of learning right. and I'm like why didn't you think that before right but it Disruptors. seems it seems that it's so um very seductive because yes. um, actually one thing that I didn't want to go too far, but I will go now for a second. Um, my Fair Lady, right? So it's based on Pygmalion uh, Bernard Shaw, but Pygmalion is also based, or the name comes from uh, the myth of right. Pygmalion and Galathair, right? But that myth is also representing the fantasy of animation that has lasted for centuries. And actually, if you read about... Exactly, or yeah. even earlier than that, right? right? If you think about it, in the real myth, um, Pygmalion not only creates the statues, he actually starts dressing her up, bringing her flowers, bringing her gifts, kissing her. So he is actually um, treating her as a human before she gets the divine inspiration from Venus or divine... Um, gift of life. Gift of life, right? right? Uh, so the idea is, as humans, and that's what's been 
my sole interest. We have so many people who are animated, like, look, your hand, it's working, how wonderful, and I didn't have to do anything, right? It's just, <laughs> <laughs> and yet we are enamored with the idea of creating objects that will become animated, humanish. right? right. Humanish, and will replace something, but what are we trying to replace? I don't know. That's a good question. That may be too philosophical for her. And maybe it's just the right time to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> so you think about it, come back on May 2nd, and we do a debate, right? Yeah? Thank you very Thank much you all. for coming. <laughs> you know what? Wait, 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 wait. I totally need your name. Thank you. Yeah? <laughs>